I'm very happy to introduce Guy Dwyer. Uh, Guy is actually from Macquarie. He's got a Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Law. You may know him from the law school. Um, but I met him, uh, I think it was about... Um, 2012, I think. Yeah, 2012. He was helping me with biodiversity, just getting the ILO page up and running. I made the remark to him that he might consider applying to be a tip star for a judge, which is something that law students might consider in the future. So he made the application and then he was working for the Chief Judge of the Land Environment Court as a tip star. Now he did that for a year, which is the usual period that you do it. And now he's working at Ashurst in planning section. Yeah, mining. Planning, mining, and natural resources section. So he's, aside from being a solicitor, he writes a great deal of um, articles and he publishes in um, journals such as the uh, Environmental Planning Law Journal, what, what local, government law journal law, uh, local Government Law Journal, etc. So uh, I thought he would uh, come and speak to us on Commonwealth Heritage Law and uh, highlight a few of the key cases. He will look at natural and cultural heritage and probably some of the cases that uh, you can look at in your courses and for other environmental law and constitutional cases. So thank you for coming. Thanks, Judith. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so just to provide you with an overview of what I intend to cover in the lecture this morning, um, I think the majority of you are undergraduate rather than postgraduate students. Is there any postgraduates in here this morning? Just, just the one, okay. Um, so for many of you, um, fundamentals of environmental law making power might have been introduced perhaps in constitutional law, but probably more likely if you've done um, planning law with Paul Govind or um, environmental law with Alexander Zahar. But I intend to touch on it this morning. Uh, I'll talk about the development of heritage law and policy at the Commonwealth level in Australia, so I won't be focusing on state and territory legislation in this area. Um, in particular, I'll be looking at the heritage provisions contained in the EPBC Act. Um, I'll touch on the listing requirements. And then I'll um, consider a few of the heritage cases which have emerged um, in the case law under the EPBC Act. Uh, my intention is not to just recite the facts in detail, recite the findings in detail and so forth because you're more than capable of, of reading a decision for yourself. What I'd intend to do, however, is touch upon some of the key themes that I think run through these cases, um, and just to sort of uh, challenge your thinking, I suppose, on those aspects. So, starting with fundamentals of environmental law making power um, in Australia. So, the Australian Constitution in section 51 provides um, that the Commonwealth is basically vested with the power to make laws for the peace, order and good government, gov government I think, um, of uh, the Commonwealth. And then it lists a series of powers in respect of which it can make laws. Um, there is no environmental law head of power as such uh, contained in section 51, which means that essentially the Commonwealth Government needs to look to other sources of power contained within Section 51 in order to make its laws with respect to environment at the federal level and also um, heritage. Perhaps the reason why we've not got an environmental head of power in the Constitution stems from um, the fact that this was a, a piece of legislation, a very important piece of legislation, which was made um, in the uh, early 1900s, late 1800s. Um, and environmental concerns at that time were perhaps not in the forefront. Um, many of the uh, environmental laws that we uh, have now at, at state levels um, emerged during the latter half of this century. So it perhaps is not surprising that we find that there is no environmental head of power contained. Um, in section 51. Since the 1970s, um, both Commonwealth and states um, have played a role in environmental uh, regulation and one of the 
key um, uh, concepts that um, exists in this regard is the idea or notion of cooperative federalism. And that was neatly encaptured in the Intergovernmental Agreement on the Environment in 1992, which I assume quite a few of you would be familiar with, maybe not so much in your study in this unit, but um, perhaps in your studies in other environmental units, um, not just law, but also natural resource management if you're doing science as well. So laws at the Commonwealth level in respect of heritage conservation are generally made pursuant to the external affairs power, um, but there are also potentially other powers that could be drawn upon in order to make um, laws concerning heritage. So for example, the, the trade and commerce power could potentially be used in respect of dealings um, between people in respect of um, uh, cultural heritage artefacts, for example. Um, other powers may include, for example, the corporation's power. So the need for heritage conservation in Australia was um, really brought to the forefront um, in legislative and policy circles um, in about 1974. So um, that was um, the year in which the National Estate Report was produced. Um, this was quite hot on the heels of the World Heritage Convention um, being finalised, um, which occurred I think in December 1972, but no doubt the correct dates in your, your, um, your readings, but I, I think that was the, the time it, it occurred. Um, the term national estate was essentially coined by the Premier of Tasmania, whose name I think was Eric Rees. Um, whether I'm remembering that right or not, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, he essentially used it as a term to describe the things you keep. So it was quite a simple notion which underpinned the national estate. So it, it was essentially directed to being a protective force um, to help safeguard species and ecosystems, which may prove to be vitally important, um, as well as cultural and recreational areas which contribute to the mental and physical well-being of the nation. So in that statement there, you can see a theme that runs through pretty much all your heritage law readings where there is a dichotomy that's drawn between uh, cultural heritage on the one hand and natural heritage on the other. Um, it's not always a clear cut distinction to make, but um, it's commonly adopted by writers in this area. The first comprehensive statute at the Commonwealth level um, was the Australian Heritage Commission Act 1975 and it was based on the recommendations that were made in the National Estate Report. It was essentially administrative in nature rather than substantive in that it set up an Australian Heritage Commission which was conferred with functions with respect to um, uh, conserving, protecting um, matters of uh, matters falling within the national estate. Um, the Functions are outlined in Section 7 of the uh, old Act, which you can find in the repealed um, legislation on Osley. It's worth a look just to see what this legislation was like at the time. Um, but it is no longer in force, of course. Um, it was criticised in the 1990s by the Council of Australian Governments as duplicating state responsibilities and failing to provide substantive protection. So again, it goes back to the point that I made before, that it was quite an administrative based statute rather than substantive. Um, it didn't really provide for identification of places of national significance at all, because national significance was not really identified as a key concept within that legislation. Um, it essentially provided for the maintenance of a register and that was one of the functions that the Australian Heritage Commission was conferred with under the legislation. So dissatisfaction um, in the early 1990s, and we must recall that that's occurring at the same time as the Intergovernmental Agreement on the Environment is being finalised, um, led to 
proposals for reform which inevitably became embodied in the EPBC Act, which remains in force today and is the main piece of uh, Commonwealth legislation um, with respect to um, protection of heritage. Of course, there's other statutes as well that are also very important, um, such as the Indigenous uh, heritage legislation, which I have no doubt Judith would have talked to you about, um, or if she hasn't yet, she no doubt will, because that forms the basis of her, her doctorate. So this is the one and only picture I have um, in, the, uh, in the slides. Um, but there were two, there, were, there was probably more than two, but I've, I've provided two, and the Tasmanian Dams case was the main uh, uh, heritage constitutional case. Um, it's the, Con the Tasmanian Dams case is widely regarded as being a landmark in Australian heritage law, and I, I wouldn't quibble with that. I, I think that's probably right, but um, I think it's more important, um, sig well, its greater significance lays in the fact that it provided a clear um, exposition of the scope and nature of the external affairs power contained in the Constitution. So you actually find that constitutional lawyers who have generally no interest in the environment at all <laughs> um, very much recognise this case and, um, and regard it as a vitally important one in the development of Australian constitutional law. Hands up um, who managed to have a read of that case um, prior to today. Um, oh, you did very well, Judith. Very good, very good, Judith. Um, I uh, must admit, the last time I read that case in great depth was in third year constitutional when I was studying here. Um, I didn't bother picking it up again to read prior to today because when I had a quick look at it at work, I noticed it was 300 something pages. Um, I remembered it being long, but not quite that long. And the, the head note, um, which the, the poor person for writing for the Commonwealth Law Reports had to compile, is 12 pages, which is extremely long for a summary of a case. Um, and I, I also noticed at the beginning of the report that the High Court attempted to, uh, in effect, summarise its own decision. And at that time, it was quite unusual for the High Court to take the step of providing a note um, as to what their reasons were really um, all about. It was a close decision, and identifying the, the ratio can be difficult at times, um, but it's generally regarded as a 4-3 split. Um, in the High Court. Uh, each judge had something to say um, in respect of the issues. Um, if I was advising anyone to pay particular attention to one judge's reasons over the other, uh, as usual, I would always recommend reading the judgments of Justices Mason and Brennan, um, who both formed part of the uh, majority in that case. So. Um, in essence, I'll, I'll try and give you a brief summary of what the issues were all about. So the Tasmanian government wanted to construct a Franklin um, Gordon Dam, um, and that was to be located within the Tasmanian wilderness um, area. Uh, it was, the Tasmanian wilderness area was subsequently listed in 1982, so that's a year before this case was reported on. Um, and uh, as a result of the listing um, of the Tasmanian wilderness under the World Heritage Convention, Australia had obligations that it needed to meet under that, that convention um, in respect of its protection, conservation and management of that area. So that, in essence, required the introduction of domestic legislation. Um, and the um, Labor opposition, led by Bob Hawke, um, prior to the um, election, um, which he won, um, campaigned, um, and it was a very important part of his political campaign, on the pledge that um, the uh, Franklin Dam, it would, it would basically stop the Tasmanian government from carrying out its intentions to build this dam. And it was elected, and then it subsequently passed legislation which was called the World Heritage Properties Conservation Act 1983. 
And effectively, what that legislation did, the Commonwealth legislation, was effectively prohibit the ability for the Tasmanian government to um, implement uh, the dam project. So um, Tasmania, the government of Tasmania challenged the constitutional validity um, of the act which had been passed um, by the Commonwealth government and um, intervening states also appeared because it was an important case with respect to defining the parameters between Commonwealth and, legis uh, and state legislative power. So a mo majority of the High Court um, supported the, the Commonwealth's approach. Um, it upheld a sufficient portion of the um, Commonwealth heritage legislation um, as valid expressions of the external affairs power. So in essence, the High Court was saying the Commonwealth had the ability to, um, to make this legislation, well, maybe not make the legislation per se, but certain provisions within the legislation were valid, validly made pursuant to the Com Commonwealth's um, external affairs power. Um, and that, in essence, allowed the Commonwealth government to um, pull Tasmania into line, as it were, and that project wasn't able to proceed. Um, Richardson and Forestry Commission um, involved similar issues. But in respect of Tasmanian dams, the majority um, was Justices Mason, Murphy, Brennan and Dean. But as I said before, if you are time poor and can't read through all the, all the um, judges' decisions, I would definitely recommend that you read Justice Mason and Justice Brennan's <coughs> decisions or judgments. All right, so jumping forward to the EPBC Act. Um, mm -hmm. I've called it Australia's most important piece of um, environmental legislation and it, it, I think that's, I, I doubt many people would quarrel with that. Um, part three of the Act uh, focuses on the protection of matters of national environmental significance. Um, so there are a whole heap of um, uh, protected aspects. Um, there are others that I haven't identified on this slide and just recognise that there were amendments made which um, include, included the introduction of something called the water trigger for coal seam gas and mining projects but this is not an exhaustive list of the matters of national environmental significance and in any effect, event we're only really concerned with the top two there, the declared world heritage properties and natural, um, national heritage places. Um, in terms of the architecture of the Act, uh, the concept of an action is used and that essentially is referring to some sort of development. So development's the key concept in the planning legislation in New South Wales. Um, action is the key concept um, that operates in this legislation. So if a proposed action has, will have, or is likely to have a significant impact on a matter of national environmental significance, the proponent, um, that means basically the developer, uh, of the proposed action must receive approval of the relevant uh, environment minister. So that will be the environment minister at the moment. Um, I think it's still Greg Hunt, uh, if memory serves me correctly, um, under part nine of the act. So. The Act essentially creates a prohibition on the taking of actions which are likely to significantly impact, um, but then it, you can lift that prohibition on the taking of actions where it's approved. And environmental legislation operates like that all the time in the sense that it creates prohibitions, you can't carry out development, you can't pollute waters, and then it relieves those, um, those obligations, well, that prohibition in circumstances where you've got an approval or permit or licence. And I know the Chief Judge wrote a paper about that back in 2013 when I was working for him, which deals with those theoretical concepts in, in some detail. So that's worth a read. Um, the action uh, is referred to in Section 67 as a controlled action. And the um, provisions which I outlined on the previous slide are referred to as controlling provisions. Um, jump back there. So 
part of my practice um, as a solicitor involves uh, reviewing um, uh, EPBC Act referrals for mining projects um, for various clients, um, some of whom include BHP Billiton, um, uh, Peabody Energy um, and, and other large mining companies. And um, in those referrals that they draft, they're, they're typically a form of environmental assessment. They can be quite long and uh, they have environmental consultants produce reports which um, uh, consider whether or not the action or development that is proposed to be undertaken um, has uh, a significant impact on matters of national environmental significance such that it is a controlled action. Um, when I review that, um, those referrals, I'm basically looking to make sure that the um, analysis that's conducted by the consultant um, stacks up and that it's, it's accurate. So um, with respect to uh, making decisions about a controlled action, principles of ecologically sustainable development are relevant uh, for the purposes of, of that exercise. Um, the Act it's, itself doesn't preclude New South Wales and other states from also um, making heritage laws. I mean, that, that much is obvious because we, of course, have the Heritage Act 1977 in this jurisdiction and other state jurisdictions have their own heritage legislation as well. Um, so it, it's not intended to exclude or limit the concurrent operation of, um, of state and territory laws. Um, and of course, bilateral agreements can be entered into um, between the Commonwealth and state and territory governments with respect to environmental protection and biodiversity conservation. And the same principle, I think, would apply with respect to, to heritage as well. Um, but I think that's, um, I, I won't go into that in any more detail because I think that's more appropriately dealt with in um, your environmental law course or your local government and planning law course. So the Act um, sets out strategies for long-term management of heritage places um, and I've just mentioned you know, prohibited actions can be permitted in circumstances where they're, they're approved. And Chapter 5 of the Act sets out detailed provisions as well. Um, I think there was a reading I, not a reading, there was a, a chapter I did for Planning Law in Australia which is a loose leaf service I don't know if it's a prescribed reading in this course, but I set out the Commonwealth legislation in quite some detail. So um, that's probably, I, I would refer you to that summary that um, I've prepared of the legislation. Um, starting with World Heritage properties with respect to Commonwealth heritage lists and, and listing requirements. So, like national heritage, um, world heritage properties are protected as a matter of ness um, and uh, they require management. Um, the definition of world heritage property um, is property included in the world heritage list which is kept under article 11 um, of the World Heritage Convention um, or specified in a declaration by the Minister in the Gazette. So that definition is obtained from section 13 as well as looking at the dictionary for certain defined terms that are included in the section 13 definition. So there are two um, other heritage lists um, which are contained in the EPBC Act. The National Heritage List of Natural Heritage Places. So that's a place within the Australian jurisdiction with a national heritage value um, and it's got to meet one or more of the um, criteria um, that it, uh, are laid down in the uh, regulations and I'll come to those criteria in a minute. Um, the Commonwealth Heritage List um, of Commonwealth Heritage Places is the other one and uh, again a similar approach is adopted whereby you the regulations identify criteria for um, potentially listing a place as being um, of Commonwealth heritage um, significance 
um, and that is identified in the regs. So if we jump down to the regs for the national heritage listing. So this is a non-exhaustive summary um, of some of the criteria uh, that are listed um, in Regulation 10018. Um, but the important thing to um, focus on is the chapeau um, to the uh, regulation clause. It says that the place has outstanding um, heritage value to the nation um, because of the places and then it, one or more of these criteria. Um, you can distinguish listing on the basis of um, outstanding heritage value to the nation on the national uh, heritage listing from uh, the Commonwealth heritage listing requirements. You'll see there that it refers to the place having a significant heritage value as opposed to outstanding heritage value to the nation. There's no reference of to the nation here because I suppose it is assumed that it's a Commonwealth heritage place, therefore there is no need to, to identify a nation, but it refers to significant heritage value. The criteria that are listed in this regulation are exactly the same, I think, as the criteria that you find in the National Heritage List. It's just that the chapeau is different. Um, so that, that would be the point that I'd make in respect of those two lists. So um, this is just a, a quote that I've grabbed from um, the Local Government Planning and Environment Loose Leaf Service from um, a chapter that's written by uh, Emeritus Professor Ben Bohr um, and Stefan Gruber. Um, ben Bohr is the, um, the whiz when it comes to heritage. He, uh, wrote the heritage law text um, that is, no, I don't think he's updated the, <laughs> ever written a second edition. So the most recent version of that text is 2006. Um, it's a shame he hasn't written a new one. But the, um, I digress. The quote focuses um, on the fact that the EPBC Act, when it came into force, provided for the continuation of the Register of National Estate, which I talked about earlier. Um, but it's essentially maintained as an archive um, of, of places, an archive of information. Um, so it's sort of uh, for historical value only that that register is maintained. I do from time to time when I'm re reviewing um, EIS documentation um, or EPBC Act referrals, come across references that consultants have made to places which are listed in the archives of the um, Register of the National Estate. So um, there is still some uh, relevance, I suppose, um, but uh, it certainly pales in significance to uh, the current legal requirements that are contained in the um, EPBC Act and in state uh, legislation. So um, this is another quote, um, the, it's from the Rosemary Lister et al um, text which I understand has just had a new edition come out either last month or this month. Um, so I'm working off the version that I um, had when I was studying planning law. So the page reference will be wrong but I'm sure you'll probably find that this is still in the new text. Um, heritage places derive much of their uh, protection from being entered on a heritage list. So heritage lists have a very important um, role. And the authors say that it's important to understand the listing process, uh, including who nominates a place for listing and who decides whether to list. So they're, they're key things that should be kept in mind when one is critically examining or, or um, analysing uh, lists that are provided for by um, legislation. Uh, there's a reference there saying that proposals for listing considered vexatious, frivolous or not in good faith may be reject rejected. 
I probably shouldn't included that. That's quite trite, I think. Um, the Australian Heritage Council provides um, expert advice on the suitability of a place for listing. Um, and a, a similar um, uh, approach is adopted in New South Wales as well, in that the, um, the Heritage Council provides advice um, to the, the Minister um, in respect of um, uh, listing places on the State Heritage um, Register. Um, so, I mean, my understanding is that um, uh, the public, yeah, the public can make nominations. It's generally best that they engage a heritage consultant who is actually able to um, digest the listing criteria and address um, those criteria in um, submitting a proposal for a place to be listed. You can't just simply say, um, I, I, I think this place should be listed without actually addressing the criteria. Um, so you have to address the criteria and make out a strong case for um, the item to be listed under whatever the, the list is that you're seeking to have it listed under. All right, um, I will now touch upon um, some of these cases uh, which are listed here before opening the floor up to any questions or comments that you might have. Um, Booth and Bosworth is the first one that I'll look at. Um, it's quite a famous case uh, in environmental law, particularly at the Commonwealth level. So you will have um, encountered it um, no doubt before. So basically you had a mother and son who operated a lychee farm in North Queensland. And the uh, lychee farm was neighbouring um, the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. Uh, the World Tropics World Heritage Area, uh, area had um, flying foxes um, flying around and the, the flying foxes didn't mind the lychees. Um, and they decided, the mother and son who operated the farm, to construct this big electri ele electrified fence um, to basically prevent the flying foxes from, um, from ruining the, their lychee um, uh, farm uh, produce. So um, the applicant in this case brought proceedings under section 475 in the EPBC Act seeking um, relief in two forms. One, uh, a prohibitory injunction which, if granted, would have the effect of restraining um, the lychee farm uh, mother and son duo from uh, operating this electric fence. Um, and the second form of relief they sought was essentially to have the um, uh, the fence removed completely and abolished. Um, or not abolished, but uh, removed, deconstructed. Um, the case um, involved quite detailed consideration of um, the heritage, World Heritage um, Properties provisions contained in the EPBC Act. Um, and focused on um, we'll, we'll set out in quite some detail the process by which one um, uh, essentially uh, get, well not gets around, but um, lifts the prohibition. So I was talking earlier about the fact that the Act provides for prohibitions on impacts that have a significant, significant impact on World Heritage properties um, and you obtain approval um, to construct your activity. Now there was no doubt in this case that the electric fence was an action for the purposes of the Act which could significantly impact um, on the World Heritage properties of the wet tropics area. Um, but there's two key points to make. One, no approval was ever sought by the mother and son to erect this fence and, and, op and operate it in a way that provided that significant impact under the EPBC Act. There was no referral. Um, and secondly, 
the case wasn't being brought because um, the uh, electric fence was operating to kill flying foxes. It was, I mean, that was sort of part of it, but really the, the, the key reason why was because the flying foxes formed an integral part of the world heritage values of the wet tropics area. So it's not like we're viewing the flying foxes in um, isolation from the area itself. Um, and there were some key points made by Her Honour um, Justice Branson in, in giving her decisions. She had little hesitation in granting the prohibitory injunction um, but because she was satisfied that the um, flying foxes uh, formed an integral part of the reason why the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area was listed in the first place under the World Heritage Convention. Um, so there was little doubt in Her Honour's mind that she should grant the prohibitory injunction uh, and the respondents didn't really offer any evidence. That was another key aspect of this case to sort of make their own case out that no injunction should be granted. So Her Honour's decision in that respect was quite easy to make. She declined to make a specific order with respect to having the fence completely removed or um, eradicated. Um, and Her Honour's reasons for that were essentially the mother and son duo could actually apply for approval for their fence under the Act and providing that the Minister approved the operation of that, that fence, um, that would lift the prohibition that otherwise exists um, as a result of the provisions of the EPB and C EPBC Act. So that, th those are the, the key things that I think emerge from Booth and Bosworth, but it's certainly a case that's worth a read. The second one is much shorter. Um, it's a decision of Justice Dowsett in Schneider's and the State of Queensland. Um, again, it was an application um, in respect of an injunction. This time, the application was not successful. So um, in this case, uh, the Queensland government had resolved to basically um, uh, kill at least, well, I think it was a maximum of 30 dingoes that um, were on Fraser Island um, after a, an eight-year-old boy um, had been killed by one, mauled by one. Um, and the um, applicant in this proceeding was concerned about the killing of these dingoes because um, Fraser Island has a very small population of dingoes and their dingoes are considered to be a more sort of pure form um, of dingo than the dingoes that exist on mainland Australia which have um, you know, intermingled with um, uh, other domestic dogs. Um, in this case, uh, Justice Dowsett, I thought, gave a very carefully reasoned decision um, he considered that it was a, an essential matter of public safety that, um, that the Queensland Government had taken this action to cull um, up to 30 dingoes. Um, so he wasn't prepared to grant the prohibitory re injunction restraining them, but he was quite clear in making um, the point that he was refusing such relief because of basically the submissions that the Queensland Government had said to, had, had made to the court, which was, we're not you know, intending to go and kill all the dingoes on the island, we're just killing so many as we think are, are needed, and we capped it. Um, so um, that was uh, a key aspect of why His Honour decided not to grant the prohibitory injunction. But again, it's only a short um, decision. It's, it's worth having a read as well. The other two I don't intend to look at in great detail at all, but um, I'll just make a couple of points about them. Both are essentially administrative law cases. Both are concerned with applications made under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act. So you, you would have generally encountered, for those undergraduates um, in the, in, in the room, um, you would have encountered 
all this stuff in administrative law. Um, so you have traditional grounds on which you seek judicial review being failure to take into account a relevant mandatory matter, failure, uh, sorry, um, having regard to an irrelevant um, matter, um, jurisdictional error, jurisdictional fact error, so on, unreasonableness. These cases were generally um, relevant, irrelevant consideration based cases. Um, and to some extent both provide some um, explanation of what um, impacts means under the Act um, and, and uh, sort of set out the legislative scheme quite well. Um, I don't intend to, to read them, I'll, I'll just uh, leave it to you in your own time to, to look at those. But um, keep in mind that when you're reading them, that uh, one, one should always be uh, recalling the, the structure of the EPBC Act, how it works, how it operates in a sense of creating prohibitions, then relieving them, um, and then uh, also, you know, respecting the fact that there's this traditional administrative law flavour running through these cases. Um, that's all I really propose to say. Um, thank you for your patient attention. I'm happy to take any questions and to the extent that I can answer them I'll, I'll try but um, unless there's any questions I'll happily sit down. Yep. Um, with Booth and Bosworth, um, so you did the judge basically just say turn on the electricity any time. So I think because it seems like if she said it's not okay as it is, so apply to the minister and like, do it the right way. It seems like, I mean, this is never approved that if it's the court's already said that you're, you know, it's not. Yeah. The box is open for you. I get some legislation to fill the many boxes. Yep. Um, so basically, the specific relief that was granted by the judge, I think, I'll read it out because it's worth having regard to. So she made the prohibitory injunction which restrained the respondent from causing, procuring or allowing the death or injury, whether by ex ex electrocution, shooting or otherwise, of flying foxes on, on the farm. Um, and then the second order, dismantling any construction or device um, used for killing flying foxes by electrocution. So the, the fence was essentially switched off as it were, so they couldn't electrocute bats. But the, but the actual fence itself remained, and you're quite right to point out that she was unprepared to um, order its complete demolition on the basis that um, they could seek approval for it to operate the electricity-based fence. Whether um, the farmers um, subsequently made an application um, for, uh, sorry, a referral, for approval under the EPBC Act, I'm not sure. It seems like um, like that shouldn't be the reason to not knock down the fence because it wasn't the fence that was the problem. It was that it was electrified and it was in the flying boxes. Like surely you can have a fence regardless. Like so. Can I add just something to that? Um, if you look at so just the website active Brisbane Brass website. Four hundred a night, um, and then that figure was extrapolated over the series of the um, uh, the lychee season, which I think was six to eight weeks. So you multiplied it out, and you ended up at a figure like twenty thousand um, that were killed 
that would have been killed over the period. So it was significant. That's true that netting was identified as a potential um, option, but I think the judge found um, that she shouldn't make an order providing for that fen uh, for that netting to occur because the cost I think was a million dollars to install the netting, and then maintenance costs a year of a hundred thousand or something like that. So um, she considered that to be sort of prohibitory, it's too expensive. Yep. Um, I'm just curious, I'm, I'm assuming that when you're at Macquarie you pursue this area of work because you wanted to potentially use your skills to protect the environment, would that be correct? No, not necessarily so. Um, I find the area quite interesting. Um, it's quite common for people who study environmental law to um, take the approach that they're going to work for the Environmental Defender's Office, how dare you represent any one who is taking development or action which has an environmental impact. Um, I think one needs to recall the fact that there are certainly cases where um, there are projects which just have completely unacceptable um, environmental impacts such as they should not be approved. In other circumstances there are other factors at play which favour granting approval to those pro projects. Um, and that's what ESD is all about, um, balancing considerations between development on the one hand and uh, environmental protection on the other. It used to be quite a clear-cut dichotomy between those two extremes, but you find now that developments which in the past wouldn't have really had regard to environmental factors are now building environmental protection controls into their project design. Um, such as to better give effect to principles of ESD. Um, so I consider myself to be a little bit more pragmatic. I don't think there's a way to, that you can say that, um, you know, um, there's a clear distinction between you either pr protect the environment or you don't. Um, you've got to remember that development to some extent is inevitable um, and it, it's, the, the, it's not an easy area um, to, to work in or to propose solutions because you know there's human rights and development on the one hand, particularly in developing countries and on the other, uh, environmental protection. Not easy. Um, but yeah, that's the best <laughs> answer I can give to your question. But if you've got a follow-up question, yeah. Um, well, I was going to ask, I think you mentioned um, whether in your line of work you feel like maybe your environmental values are sometimes compromised by your work, by certain projects. N uh, no, I, I don't generally find that. Um, I think it's important that um, one recalls the aspects of, well, there's four theories of legal ethics. For those of you who have done the legal ethics course, you might remember the article that was written by Christine Parker and she identifies an adversarial advocate and a responsible lawyer and ethics of care and there's another one as well. Um, there's uh, an approach to lawyering which is sort of to the effect of you're there to represent a client, to represent their interests to the best of your ability, subject to overriding duties that you may have to the court. Um, some legal ethicists argue that there's a moral dimension to um, your legal practice. I must say that in my practice I tend to adopt an approach which is um, the responsible lawyering type approach in the sense that I generally will put my feelings to one side um, and work impartially to the objective that my client has within the bounds of the law. Uh, of course I won't do anything that's <laughs> contrary to law because that would mean that I'd, I'd be essentially risking cancellation of my practicing certificate. No solicitor should ever put themselves in such a position. Um, but uh, I, I generally put my feelings to one side and focus on the objectives of the client to the extent that they can be achieved within the law. Yeah. As a practitioner in the field, do you feel like being a basic good balance uh, it, it, it's, it's certainly the intention of that legislation to do so. 
Um, and in many cases, I think it does. Um, I don't think it's the most friendly piece of legislation to read, um, but I think you can say the same of the Environmental Planning Act. Unfortunately, it's regulating... Um, law struggles, I think, to regulate areas that are quite dynamic, ever-changing, and it tries to box things into categories and, and, and sort of, um, you know, accommodate all scenarios and situations, as it were. Drafting legislation in the environmental space, I think, is extremely difficult, so I, I don't envy anyone the job of having to come up with this legislation. I think it could have been better drafted than what it currently is. Um, but for the most part, I think it generally operates reasonably well in striking the balance. It's probably more so a case of ensuring that decision makers correctly apply it than rather than the content of it. Um, the, the act is there, it gives the decision makers the tools, they just need to make sure that they apply those tools correctly. Mm -hmm.